Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. This is the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruguru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 270 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by one of my best friends in the entire world, the former heavyweight world title challenger himself. It is, of course, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, my man? I'm good, my man. How you feeling? All good, man. All good. All good whenever speaking with you. Um, this is, of course, the last show before the Christmas special, which will go out next week. That will be our last uh, show before Christmas. I think we're going to probably put it out either on the Thursday, which will be, of course, Christmas Eve, or I might try and put it out on the Wednesday, so the 23rd. But either way... That's going to be our Christmas special, and um, I've I've kept the the lid on it. I've kept my mouth closed about who will feature on that podcast. Um, thoroughly looking forward to it, and um, you know, if if I'm going to just talk about the the previous Christmas special guests that we've had. Obviously, we started in 2015, uh, so this will be our sixth Christmas special podcast. The first year we had, um, in, in 2015, we had Andrew Selby, Lee Selby, Charles Martin, and Eric Molina, so four guests on the first Christmas special. 2016, we had Tom Loeffler, Hassan and Dam, and Nonito Donaire. Uh, in 2017, we had Spencer Fearon and Kelly Pavlik, and then in 2018, we had had uh, Zach Parker, Chris Algieri, and Luke Campbell. And then, of course, last year, 2019, we had just one guest, Andre Berto. So I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to give any clues away, but I'm going to say next week's show is with a guy who, it's, it's just one guy. That's the only clue I'm going to give. It's only going to be one guest. It's going to be an in-depth interview, and it's it's a big name. It's a big name from the yesteryear that um that is you know a big star in 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 british boxing for sure so that's all i'm gonna say on that matter but do not miss next week's show um anyway i also need everyone after this weekend let's get canelo smith out the way and then please send me in your your fighter of the year um pound for pound list of the year as well not of the year but your current pound for pound list um fighter of the year fight of the year ko of the year prospect of the year young fighter of the year upset of the year british fighter of the year and most improved fighter of the year i'm gonna also try to do that as well so yeah send those in after this weekend and we'll read out every single one that gets sent in and we can analyze it so that'll be interesting Uh, So send them in after this weekend, after we see Canelo fight, of course, because he is on many people's lists, um, everyone's list, actually, in in terms of pound for pound, and a lot of people's number one. So, um, yeah, let's let that weekend go first and send them in next week. But anyway, with no further ado, let's get into part one. We're going to start here with the review part, as ever. We're going to start at the Fly-By-Night Rehearsal Studios in Redditch, Worcestershire, United Kingdom. Over here... Um, a win on the undercard for Mick Hennessy Jr. He's now 5-1 and one with a draw. A points win over um, over Dow Arrowsmith um, over six rounds there. Uh, also on the bill, the McKenna brothers, the two Irish brothers. You've got Aaron McKenna. He scored a, a second-round retirement win against Jordan Granham, who's now 5-72. and 72, uh, Sorry, 5-73 and 73 with three draws. Um, he is obviously a very, you know, a solid journeyman. So to get him out of there, very, very impressive. I think he's the only guy to have ever stopped him, if I'm not mistaken. And Stephen McKenna as well. He was able to TKO in five rounds. MJ Hall, who's now 2-58 and 58 with two draws. Stephen McKenna, 5-0. and oh, Sorry, 6-0. and oh, And Aaron McKenna, 11-0. and oh. um, I'm not sure which one of the brothers now stopped the guy that had never been stopped before. One of them, anyway, stopped a guy who had never been stopped before. Both real experienced journeymen. So they are um, two brothers to really look out for. Um, Great to see them both on the same card. 
Uh, the main event, though, Sam Eginton, the Savage. He's now 29-7. and seven, A TKO for him in six rounds against Ashley Fearfane, who's now 48-9 and nine with a draw. Um, Fearfane was given a count in the second round, and he was down prior to the stoppage in the sixth and final round. Um, he came to give it a go, Ashley Fearfane, but he was kind of stuck in a shell a little bit. Sam Eginton... You know, when he's on the front foot, he's like a wrecking ball, and Ashley Fearfane couldn't keep him off. And when Ashley Fearfane did land some nice shots, they seemed like they had absolutely no power on them, and they did not trouble Eggington whatsoever. So he pretty much walked through Ashley Fearfane and got the stoppage, which is quite impressive, really, because Eggington, even though he's known for kind of doing what I said, you know, walking through people and taking loads of shots and, you know, coming back stronger and turning fights into wars and stuff like that. Um, to get to get Ashley Fearfane out of there is quite impressive. Ashley Fearfane had only been stopped in one fight in all those 50-something fights, and that one was to uh, Adrian Broner. So a good win there for, for Eggington, and Ashley Fearfane has decided to retire off the back of that. So all the best to him. He's a friend of the show. I wish him well in retirement. Uh, moving out now to Wembley Arena in London, United Kingdom. We're going to start here with the undercard. Um... Florian Marku, he's the Albanian fighter. He uh, went into the bout with a record of 7-0. and He took on Jamie Stewart, who was 2-0. and Jamie Stewart, of course, only given about three or four days' notice. He was down in the second round as well, a body shot. Um, I thought Florian Marku would probably stop him early, pretty much because, you know, there's so much hype around Marku and, you know... This guy, Jamie Stewart, only had three or four days' notice. So I really fancied him to do a job on him. But um, but yeah, it wasn't how it was. It ended up in a draw, um, only the, the referee scoring the fight. So uh, Marcus McDonnell had it 76-76. A lot of people arguing with that card. Perhaps they were right to be angry. But um, yeah, it doesn't look good, you know. It's, it's obviously, um, you know, they say that fights aren't, on one on paper and stuff like that, you know, but on paper, that's a draw. That's a draw on his record, so hopefully we get to see a rematch. But credit to Jamie Stewart, man. He showed up, and he gave it his all, and he only had a few days' notice, and maybe he didn't deserve to win, but it's a bad look, that, for Florian Mark, who should have got him out there in a round or two. Also on the bill, Kez Ashfak picked up a win, a fourth-round TKO against Ashley Lane. Uh, Kez Ashfak now 9-1. and one. Kieran Conway picked up a win against McCauley, uh, McCauley McGowan. Um, a complete shutout win for, for, for Conway. He's now 16-1 and one with a draw. Miguel was down in the eighth round of that fight. Uh, Huey Fury picked up a win, a unanimous decision win over 10 rounds against Marius Wack. Uh, Wack now 36-7. and seven. Huey Fury now 25-3. and three. Um, He was cut badly as well, Huey Fury, in the fourth round. And to be honest, I think they could have got out of that fight if they wanted to. I think he could have said that he couldn't see out of his eye. It was a he was a horrific cut, but he decided to carry on. And like I say, it happened. I think in the fourth round or the third round, whatever. When it went past that four round mark, and you know it's not going to go down as a as a you know a technical draw. He could have found a way out, but he didn't. And um, fair play to him. You know, he continued with that bad cut and real real shout out to his to his cornerman uh, K- Kerry Kays, who managed to um, work on the cut and. You know the cut was getting. They, they, I think they said it on the commentary. The cut was getting, uh, was 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 getting better. His eye was getting better as the fight went on, which is ridiculously silly when you think about that. that I mean, how can your eye be getting better the more rounds you go? But that's what was happening. Brilliant job in the corner there. Um, let's see what happens next for Huey Fury. I think he deserves a big fight. He's definitely up there in terms of the top heavyweights in the world, whether you like it or not. He is up there, and. Um, Wack, pretty much to me anyway, is the definition of a gatekeeper. So to to to, to get a win over him, he doesn't lose to any to any slouches at all. So a win over Wack, I'd like to see him pushed on, and um, yeah, you know, credit to him. Uh, also on that card, we got to see Martin Bacoli pick up a win, a unanimous decision over ten rounds. He's now sixteen and one against Sir uh, Guy Kuzmin, who's now fifteen and two. Um, again, both men had that one loss to Michael Hunter. It was for the vacant WBC international heavyweight title. I was one of the very, f- very, very few people that actually thought Kuzmin won the fight. Um, 
I don't know if I'm just, you know, I don't know bleep about boxing, but I really thought you won. I wouldn't say you don't know bleep about boxing. It's, you know, you, you watch boxing all the time. You're involved. You know, it's just, just as much about boxing as Al Bernstein from watching it. I mean, he has more experience being that he's, you know, been on the earth you know, longer than you and probably been studying boxing a little longer, but he's never taken a punch. So what does that make him know? Just wouldn't that make him knowing just about as much as you, except for maybe he has a little more, he's more of a historian at this point, but that's it. Well, I mean, I, I'm just saying when I was kind of talking on Twitter, some people were saying that I, um, I, you know, that no one agreed with me on Twitter, put it that way. A lot of people were mad when I was tweeting. And I think Gareth A. Davies, who was working for The Zone on the night, I think he had Kuzmin winning the fight. But I had Kuzmin wide. Um, Kuzmin actually showed up in horrendous shape as well. And I did actually miss the first two rounds, so I've got to put that out there as well. But from the third round onwards, I mean, I gave three, four, five, and six to Kuzmin. Bacoli had absolutely no defense. You know, he's got a tremendous chin. Uh, without that tremendous chin, he'd have probably gone down a few times um he got nailed with with big hooks from both hands of kuzmin and i just felt that even though the fight was being fought at in the center of the ring bacoli was just standing there waiting way too patient way too lazy waiting to counter and he's taking too many shots while he's trying to wait for the perfect moment so i i don't know but he he was the guy that was was coming forward a lot and that's what i think a hell of a lot of people get influenced by the guy who's coming forward, not about who's landing the cleaner punches. They're not counting that. A lot of people just see a guy coming forward and a guy backing up. Oh, it looks like the guy coming forward must have won that round. I don't score fights like that. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but I don't care. It is what it is. I'm not involved. I'm not, you know, I wasn't one of the judges. I don't really care who won the fight. But one thing I did predict, which a lot of people didn't predict is that the fight would 110% go to distance. So I told people to back that one if they're betting men, and I don't know if anyone did, <laughs> but I got that right. Anyway, I called that from before the fight, and don't worry, um, I <laughs> someone said it to me on Twitter, Eddie, during this fight, they said to me, you know, that statement that Kuzmin has won the fight, they said something along the lines of, that is a horrific statement. Uh, you know, they were getting <laughs> on to me and all that. And then a few hours later on in the night, I made another prediction before a fight that was very unpopular. No one said the same thing as me. And that prediction ended up coming true. And then that same guy come back to me and said, fair enough, you've redeemed yourself. It only took you a few hours. I know you had. I knew you had it in you. So um, I redeemed myself only a few hours later on in the night. And we'll get onto that fight in due course. Another win on the undercard for Lawrence Okoli. A bit frustrating for him. He wanted to end the year as a world champion. It wasn't his fault that Glowacki pulled out the fight with coronavirus. In step, the undefeated Nikodem Jezuski, who was 19-0 and with a draw. Uh, Jezuski was down twice in the first round and once in the second round. It was for the vacant WBO International Cruiserweight title. Um, Akoli, like I say, 15-0. and This guy was, was really bad, man. I mean, he was getting clipped and it was getting dangerous. The commentary on the zone, I thought, was pretty spot on with what they were saying. It seemed like um, he, you know, his legs were dancing. He, he got back up. He he was being clipped, and he his whole body just was not in sync with with it, with itself. And it, it was getting dangerous. They said, "Listen, this they got to stop this fight right now. This is neurological." And it kind of took the words out of my mouth. He looked in tremendous trouble. I hope he's okay. Actually, um, I haven't heard anything since the fight about the guy, but he was he was brutally taken out. And moving up to the main event, of course, Anthony Joshua now 24 and one, a successful defense for his WBA, IBF, WBO, and IBO heavyweight world titles against Kubrat Pulev, who's now uh, 28 and two, a KO in the ninth round for Anthony Joshua. And to be honest, it pretty much went exactly how I predicted it'd go. Um, you know. Joshua obviously put Pulev down twice in the third round. Pulev turned his back on the first one, I think it was. Um, and some people are saying it should have got stopped there. I don't think he intentionally kind of turned his back. I think he was just trying to run away for a second because he was getting shots landed on him clean every every second. So he tried to kind of run away as fast as he could. And of course, to run away as fast as you can, you've got to be facing the way you're running. That's what I think he tried to do. Um, Joshua couldn't miss him with the uppercut as well that he kept landing there. Uh, the fourth round was a better round from Pulev. Still, Joshua, of course, was dominating. Uh, 
Um, you know, round six, I'm just kind of skimming through these rounds. Pulev was doing much better at that point. He was starting to let his hands go finally. Uh, he was repeatedly trying to land the straight one, two, but Joshua, to his credit, was able to either duck it or move his head to the side uh, and slip it. So good head movement from Joshua, good mobility, good footwork as well from Joshua. Um, I didn't pay for it. I streamed it. In round eight, my stream died. Um, but yeah, you know, it was what I thought it was. I, I thought Anthony Joshua would take him out between, I really thought he'd probably take him out around about the fifth round. And I thought if it's not the fifth round, it's going to be the sixth, seventh or eighth. He got him out of there in round nine. It was as I expected. Like I say, I wasn't impressed too much at all. I, I, I predicted it go that way. I don't think you can be, um, impressed when someone completely doesn't outdo your expectations. I said that Pulev would probably have a couple of moments in there. I think he had some small moments here and there, maybe. But um, yeah, Joshua did what, what I thought he'd do and, and took him out a bit later than I thought, but it was a good win. It was a good win. I don't, I've seen a few people out there, by the way, saying that version of Anthony, uh, that version of Anthony Joshua would beat Tyson Fury. I cannot understand. I cannot understand sure. that. Anyway, let me throw it over to the expert. Eddie, take it away. What did you see? Oh my god! Uh, somebody said that because you know many people said got, that, and, and and that's crazy for somebody to say that. You know, you're looking at two different two different men for one. One is and and in, and in this case, and I know that size doesn't always have something to do with it, but the style of fighting has a lot to do with it. And Pulev is a good two inches shorter or so than Anthony Joshua, and fights himself tries to fight from the outside so he had to kind of change his style to a degree and be obviously more aggressive which he did obviously unsuccessfully tyson on the other hand <laughs> will be boxing from the outside and anthony joshua would have to figure out a way at some in some crazy way to get inside and i know he would be very unsuccessful with the version that i've seen fighting pull at because first of all, that's two different kinds of situations he's going to be in. In this situation, he was trying to keep Pulev out. The other, the other situation, he's going to be trying to get in. So it's a different world for one. Then the skill level difference is on like a, a like a whole nother planet than what he faced that night. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to say Pulev is you know was never this or never that because you know most of, you know for most of his career when we seen him fight, he, you know he was pretty pretty credible. But I th honestly think that he did better in the Klitschko fight than he did in this one. And this one went nine rounds. But this just gave us a chance to see more of him. You know what I mean? And the flaws that he had in this particular situation when he's not, you know, controlling the the range and controlling the fight itself. And he just didn't, honestly, just didn't look good. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that Joshua didn't have anything to do with it, but I just don't think he looked good. I don't think this version of him was his best version. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm trying to say that, you know, he, he has never been good, but I'm just saying this version of, him, I'm not trying to say he's, oh, he was way too old or he got old overnight. I'm just saying this version, what I seen that night, honestly, didn't look like a heavyweight championship title challenger. That's my opinion. Maybe it was because Anthony Joshua did his job well enough to make him look average, but that's just what I saw. You understand what I'm saying? And, <laughs> He really had a very he, – he was he, – he, I don't know if he's ever been a good defensive fighter. I've never really watched him much, you know what I mean? But he looked completely out of place trying to defend. I mean, he was taking almost everything that Anthony was throwing. You know, and, and, and to, to Anthony Joshua's credit, he was creative with some of his shots. I mean, he was doing some good stuff that I would consider little guys do. So it was it – was, he had some good things going for him, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that he wasn't doing a good job in there. But he's not going to be able to do those types of things with Tyson Fury because it's a different kind of fight. He's going to have to press him, and he's going to be taking a whole lot more punishment to get into range to land his shots. You understand what I'm saying? So, and Pulev, I mean, we don't even want to talk about that. That wouldn't even be a good warm-up for Tyson at this point. I'm not just trying to compare the two guys. I'm actually talking about what I saw on that particular fight. It just doesn't, it just didn't look good from Pulev's side. You know what I mean? And I'm not hating. It's just the fact that I didn't see much from him. You know what I mean? And like I said, maybe it had a lot to do with Anthony Joshua. But Anthony Joshua did a great job. He, you know, he was using his jab. He, he, he had better footwork. He was doing some things that, honestly, before I didn't see him do a lot. But um, he had a version of Pulev in front of him that he could do just about whatever he wanted to in. You know what I mean? With So 
you know, credit to Joshua. He did a good job. You know what I mean? He handled business. But um, as far as um, the plan that he had, perfect in a sense to, to, to try to kind of stay on the outside and, you know, and, and pick pull of apart as he tried to get through, especially that not being his game and literally forcing him into a position that he's not even comfortable with. You know what I mean? I kind of, I kind of, I, I obviously like what they did there and the uh, right uppercut looked real good, honestly. He was throwing it with, you know, precision, you know what I mean? Even though the guy in front of him wasn't able to move his head or do anything like that, but he was, uh, he was doing a good job with that. I and mean, he did, like I said, he looked good, but don't get confused with what he was doing in there with a guy who was standing directly in front of him that didn't have a lot to give him versus a guy who's probably the best heavyweight in the world right now. Well, no, not probably is the best heavyweight in the world right now, skill wise and other, and then obviously a whole four, four, four inches taller, you know, maybe five inches taller, you know what I mean? With better hand speed, better, better, uh, uh, movement. It's just going to be a very, very different fight. And you know, I can't wait to get the opportunity to see it. Yeah. I, I really hope we get to see it in 2021, but, um, yeah, Pulev just for me didn't seem his old self. It's understandable. The guy's forty years of age now. Um, he he couldn't get the jab going. Once you know, once he couldn't get the jab going, to be honest, that was it. I mean, he's got a great jab when he can use it, and he kind of sets things up off the jab. But he just couldn't get the jab going at all. It was non-existent. And um, yeah, you know, obviously Vladimir, as we know, be a better and younger version of of Kubrat Pulev. So. I just can't see why some people are thinking that uh, this win was just tremendous. But anyways, it was what it was. It mm. wasn't the fight we wanted to see. Uh, moving on from that, we're going to go now to the, uh, to the, where should we go? To the Mohegan Sun Casino uh, in Connecticut, USA. A um, couple of fights to mention over here. I'm going to start with the main event. Chris Colbert. Um, a brilliant knockout for him. An 11th round TKO against Jaime Arboleda. Um, Arboleda now 16-2. and two. Chris Colbert 15-0. and 0. It was for the interim WBA Super Featherweight World title. He was leading on the cards very wide, Colbert. But the, the knockout in the end was, was brutal. Uh, Richardson Hitchens, a young guy, very good prospect. Um, he was able to win a split decision over 10 rounds against former world champion Argenis Mendez. He predicted a knockout win Hitchens and that's the one there I was trying to bet on it over here to say it's definitely going the distance but I couldn't find any uh, anywhere that would take that bet so uh, anyway he, he won on points a split decision over 10 he's now 12-0 and 0. Um, didn't actually see that fight so I couldn't tell you exactly what happened and another one from the undercard Ronald Ellis he's now 18-1 and 1 with two draws very very fortunate guy um I'm not sure if I'd say he's fortunate or his opponent is very unfortunate. I think the opponent is very unlucky. Matty Korobov, obviously, the guy was a brilliant amateur. Um, 28 and 4 now with a draw. I think he's got to be about 36 or 37. He was destined to become a world champion, man, when he turned over. And, you know, he had a world title shot against Andy Lee he was winning that fight Andy Lee then picked one of those famous Andy Lee punches out of out of the sky knocked him out um so he lost that one then he you know he came back he got a chance against Jamal Charlo a lot of people thought he won that fight Jamal Charlo got the decision in uh, in America then he came back he boxed Chris Eubank Jr he was winning the fight it was only I think in the second round so it was very early still but he won the first round then he dislocated his shoulder and had to be pulled out in the second round so we didn't get to see that fight um, you know, finished the way it should have done. And then he took a whole year out the ring, returned here against this prospect, Ronald Ellis. He was a favorite to win. Once again, he's winning the fight through the first four rounds. Um, Don Ackerman even gave him every single round. Um, Steve Weisfield had uh, three rounds to one for Korobov, and Glenn Feldman had it a draw. But anyway, he was winning the fight on two of the cards, and he injures his ankle and couldn't continue. So he has had the most rotten luck in boxing right now, Matty Korobov. I feel very, very sorry for him. Um, just plagued with injuries, and now it seems like he's probably missed the boat because of the age factor, you know? Two fights in a row that he's suffered an injury in which he's had to stop the fight in the corner, and both times he's been winning the fight. So, yeah, very sad for him. 
Uh, moving out now to the Champion Boxing Gym in Georgia, USA. Two fights to mention over here. A win for Cassius Cheney, the undefeated heavyweight prospect. He's now 20-0. and A third-round TKO against Jason Bergman, who's now 27-19 and with two draws. This was, of course, a main event card, Kathy Duva. Um, and also the son of... The legend himself, the only four-time heavyweight world champion, Evander Holyfield, his son Evan Holyfield, now 5-0, and a TKO in the first round against Donis Reed, who's now 3-8. and Moving out now to the bubble in the MGM Grand Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, let's start with the undercard. Um... The Olympic gold medalist from 2016, Robisi Ramirez, he got a, a good win, um, a, a, a TKO in round six against Brandon Valdez. Uh, he was actually losing the fight on Adelaide Bird's card. He was winning the fight pretty much every round on Eric Cheek's card. So the scorecards were all over the place, but he managed to get the TKO in the sixth round. He's now 6-1. Six and one. Jesse Bam Rodriguez, that's the brother of Joshua Franco. Not everyone knows that, but he came back with a good win. He's now 13-0, and oh, a second round KO against Sal Juarez, who's now 25-13 and 13 with two draws. That was a brilliant win there for Jesse Bam Rodriguez. Uh, Edgar Belanga, oh boy, oh boy, this guy is incredible. Edgar Belanga now 16 and 0 with 16 first round KOs, unbelievable. He got in there with Ulises Sierra, who's now 15 and 2 with two draws. Sierra. Um, obviously only had the one loss going into the fight. It wasn't by stoppage. And he's a he's a guy that's very experienced. I didn't know too much about him as a professional, but they said on the you know on the telecast that he had been in there, you know, in training camp with Canelo. He'd been brought in for Andre Ward. Andre Ward was commentating. He said, This guy's gonna get through the first round. This guy's a tough guy. Edgar Belanga took him out. Um I think there was only about 10 or 15 seconds left in the round. Um, I can't remember how many times he had him down, but um, unbelievable. Edgar Belanga, you know, <laughs> just just an unbelievable statement. And he's got to be one of the most exciting fighters in the world, arguably. And also, he's, he's on the verge of breaking records as well. He is... Um, he holds now the record of the fourth longest first round KO streak in history. Um, he's now got 16 of them. Um, in third place is Edwin Valero. Obviously, we, we know about that, that, that crazy guy. In second place is Philadelphia's very own Tyrone Brunson. He's got 19. Um, I think Valero had 17 or 16, something like that. And um, in the number one spot is Ali Raimi, who um, scored 21 straight first round KOs. But he sadly died in an explosion five years ago in Yemen. So, um, yeah, incredible. He's in the top four for that record there. Two of the guys are dead. And, um, yeah, he's he's up there. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But apparently 2.2 million people watched his fight, I think he said. And he's now tweeting top rank on Twitter saying he wants to get paid uh, because all the eyes are watching him and he wants to get, you know, he wants his paychecks to reflect that. I think it's a little bit too early for all that stuff. That's not a good look, actually, to be tweeting Bob Arum and stuff on Twitter, making it very public. He hasn't yet fought any, you know, top, top fighters yet, but... You know, he's exciting. He's got a lot of celebrity friends. After the fight, he was FaceTiming Lil Wayne, um, you know. And um, I think he was in the last fight he had the, the the following day or whatever. He was in Snoop Dogg's house in the studio dancing with him. So he's quite a character. And he's got a lot of famous friends. I think Fat Joe's another guy, um, which that's fun. That's actually my nickname. But that's, that's a story for another day. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, also on this card, Felix Vadejo. This is where my, my, my fantastic prediction came in. He's now 27 and 2. He was TKO'd in the ninth round against Masayoshi Nakatani, the Japanese underdog who's now 19 and 1. It was for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Lightweight title. Nakatani was down in the first round and the fourth round. Vadejo was down twice in the ninth. Now, I did say, I tweeted it before the fight. I said, right before the fight, that if Nakatani is still there in the late rounds, do not write him off. That was what I said. And that tweet 
when I mean it was exactly how the fight played out. Uh, he was down twice, like I say, in the fight. He didn't look great early on, and just as I said, he was there late on. He managed to spring the huge upset and brutally knock out Vadejo. Uh, the first shot was actually a jab. Vadejo walked straight into a jab. And it was one of the most disgusting jabs I've seen land. It was like, I don't even know how he did it. It was like, I don't know, it was crazy. This guy walked into a jab in one of the worst ways I've seen. It was almost like he sprinted into a jab. It was crazy. It hurt him badly. Um, You know, he got back up and he was a knockout waiting to happen. And boom, good night. Uh, Nakatani as well was coming off 17 months of inactivity following a broken orbital bone in his fight against Tiafimo Lopez. So he was coming off that loss. He's coming off all that that, uh, inactivity. Coming off a broken orbital bone, which of course is a very dangerous thing. And he got in there. He was there late on. And yeah, he, 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 uh, he did the business, and it was impressive early on from Vadejo, because I don't think Tiafimo Lopez had Nakatani down, because of course that one went the distance, and um, yeah, he, he was just the tougher of the two, and you know, he stayed in there and got the knockout, and it's a it's a horrendous upset, but um, yeah, the reason I tweeted that is because for me, Vadejo's a little bit like, I think he's a little bit like... Um, I want to say someone like uh, I don't know. He's a lot. He's he's a lot like these guys where he can look brilliant. He can look amazing early on, but then as the fight wears on, if someone can take his shots and then put it on him late, he can't take it as much. I want to say maybe like a little bit gamboery, something like that. I'm not, there's no other comparison aside from that. They're just a little bit fragile themselves. They're great at dishing it out, but just a little bit fragile. If the guy wants to wants to make it a war and a war late on, then something about them just falls to pieces and that is what I thought could happen and that is what happened. And a lot of people were saying good call afterwards because everyone was like, what is he talking about when I tweeted it? Uh, so yeah, I was back in the game. Suddenly, I knew bleep about boxing again um (laughs) anyway moving up to the main event of course Shakur Stevenson with a win he's now 15 and oh a complete shutout win against Toka Khan Clary who's now 28 and 3 over 10 rounds there for Shakur Stevenson um he was just beating Clary to the punch a lot of the time he hurt him with a jab I think in the first round as well Stevenson but all in all um you know, it was just a technical masterclass from Stevenson. He was pretty much flawless and, yeah, technically excellent, to be honest. I mean, it wasn't the prettiest fight. It really wasn't. Um, you know, it was a little bit boring at times because it was just repetitive and he didn't really need to go through the gears. He just kind of cruised his way to a very wide point to win. I do want to see big fights for him in 2021, and I think he'll want them for himself as well. He's talking about... The Herring Frampton winner. Um, Perhaps that will happen next. But anyway, that's it for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap this up, the final thing to do is to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. It's the former interim WBA World Super Middleweight Champion. And on Friday night, this Islington icon invades Hollywood. Let's welcome the gorilla, Mr. John Ryder. John, welcome back on the show. I thought we were going to have to start again there. I thought, I thought he was going to drop out the Islet and Icon. And I thought, there's no interview with you where you don't mention that. So I'm glad, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you remember and kept it in there. <laughs> has to be said, mate. It has to be said. So, John, we last spoke uh, back in October of last year. So um, just before the just before the Smith fight. Um, of course, many felt you deserved to win that night. Um, has it been frustrating um, in the time since then, obviously it's been a mad year for everyone. But with that happening last year at the back end, I'm guessing it's, it must have been a bit frustrating, man. Yeah, and you know what? More so, no, no animosity towards Smith. I mean, he's got a massive fight this weekend. I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, hope they both come out healthy and listen. It's a hard sport, do you know what I mean? I hope, they, hope he gets the wins. I you mean, know, Patriot. I hope he does well and listen. Just. Reflects good on me if he, if he does well. Do you know what I mean? So I hope he does well and gets a victory. Although I'm a Canelo fan, and I, I think the sun shines out of his backside. I think like, listen, let's just respect the Brit. Yeah, definitely. And um, what was your immediate plan after that 
that that fight with with Smith John because obviously, like I say, it was it was a great fight. Many people felt you won. COVID come along and that pretty much messed up everyone's plans. But was there a plan kind of set out for twenty twenty um, immediately after that fight? It was, mate. It was every intention of twenty twenty is my year. Twenty twenty vision hashtag whatever, blah blah blah. And mate, COVID just come along and ruined it all. I was just full. Back to winning ways, back in title contention, and obviously this weekend I, I can potentially get back to winning ways and, and get back to title contention, but just but we're way slower than planned. You know what I mean? And John, obviously the David Lemieux fight was a fight that was talked about for a long time. Um, is that still a strong possibility? Is that still on your radar for some point in 2021? I hope so. Yeah, I mean. Um, it's a big fight for me still. Um, it's not, not that there's any bad blood there or animosity, but it's a fight that should have happened in 2019 that didn't happen, Danton getting injured. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it'd be nice for it to, to happen in 2021 if possible. And, um, yeah, put that one to bed. And, and as you mentioned, you're back fighting. That's the that's the most important thing. You're back out on Friday night in Hollywood on the Golovkin undercard against Mike Guy. Um, firstly, what's it what's it like over there in Hollywood now compared to London in terms of kind of their response to the to the pandemic? Well, this, this is um, Hollywood, Florida. Obviously, it's not Hollywood, LA. Mm-hmm. Like, we're not in the uh, the bright lights of LA, but. Um, yeah, mate, apparently people, all the locals here say that like, Florida don't really take any notice of um, rules. It's, uh, it's not really following the guidelines and they just do as they want. So we're all majorly locked down, waiting for test results, locked away from the rest of the public. Um, yeah, but I don't know, it seems pretty, pretty normal over here. I mean, as we come into the hotel, they see people surrounding them, the casino tables. So there wasn't too much social distance going on. See where I led in with the Islington, you know, from Islington to to, to Hollywood. You took the shine off it. You took the shine off it there, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this is still, it's still still Hollywood, still out of <laughs> Florida or LA. You know I mean, that Hollywood's in Montford. You know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. Um, what do you know about Mike Guy, John? Obviously, he's. You know, he's durable, he doesn't have the prettiest looking record on paper, but he's got some good wins on there if you analyse it deeply. He's not a bad fighter. Yeah, I mean, he had a good win over Dennis Dublin last year, our mama's boy. Um, a lot of lot of Brits around for fighting against... Um, George Groves. He boxed George Groves, didn't he? Did he box the gal as well? No, he didn't box the gal. He boxed Groves. He was in... No, um, he, uh, he, he, was, he was sparring, sparring with, with Eubank um, Jr. He was sparring with Eubank in preparation for... Yeah, then he went back to the um, states so, yeah, the and Brits, said that. Uh, well. Then he went back to the states and said that the gal would win the fight. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. He's got a good win over him. He's been stopped once by uh, Devitrenko, but come on, Devitrenko is like a world level fight with fighter. The Rivianchenko, good fight with Love Kid. That's it, the Rivianchenko. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then he's he's just lost to Charlo. You know what I mean, so he's, he's no mug himself. So. That was that was in the eighth round as well. So that's tired and has got to him a bit, and it was just a picture of body shot really. Yeah, done it. Yeah, um, yeah, no, and it was in the final round of their fight as well. I think it was only an eight rounder a few years back. But um, funny, you said Dimitrenko there. Dimitrenko's uh, he's a big old heavyweight that uh, Ruiz beat. I think five weeks before he upset Joshua. But anyway, that's another story. Um, Obviously, we're conducting this interview on Monday. It won't go out to the podcast. It's up later this week. But um, in terms of right now, I know that as it stands, you're waiting on the you know a coronavirus test. You're waiting for it to come back negative. Um, by the time this goes out, we'd have had that result. Um, should it come back, obviously, negative, that'd be terrible. If it comes back positive, I've heard there's some kind of... Um, sorry got that wrong haven't i if it comes back negative it's great if it comes back positive yeah. it's terrible jesus christ um i've heard that you were you, you you know you've said you'd be happy to jump on a last minute flight to texas if canelo or callum smith um couldn't couldn't you know have their fight due to failing a test i'm guessing as the kind of week goes on though it's realistically not gonna end up like that it's gonna be too soon to do that where is the cutoff point uh, how much notice would you really need to jump on a plane, man? <laughs> well, I, 
I, I think to be fair, I think it's today really. I think that's it. I mean, we I think we all get tested today, so we'll, we'll all know. We should all know by this evening what's what. So um, yeah, should one man fail a test, then we'll be straight on a plane. I suppose probably be tomorrow now, but we get into in Texas and, and crack on. But I'm I'm not really paying so much attention to it. I'm fully focused on Mike Guy Friday night and taking care of business here. And, Hollywood Florida. Yeah, and that's 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 definitely the right thing to be thinking. That's the right mindset. And Friday night is a big night for the gym. You're in Hollywood. We're not going to say which state it's in. You're in Hollywood. Craig Richards is in Redditch. Yeah. Um, how do you see his fight going down? It's a good one, John. I like that fight. No, it's a great fight. I mean, um, Shaka P has obviously got a good record. He's um, he, like British champion. His name Mark. He's also the one the Ultimate Fighter was it. Um, he's a big awkward opponent I mean it's, I think this will be the first time that Craig has ever boxed someone that's longer and ranging him so it'd be good Craig's looked great in the gym um, so I see nothing but Craig coming away with the victory yeah I feel strange calling him Craig because I always been inspired so um, you know what's the matter yeah <laughs> and obviously um, Peter Sims is with him who's over there with you John? Uh, I've got Tony Sims Charlie Sims and Dan Lawrence with me, the s and Okay, perfect team. And I want to ask you this as well, John. Every every December, everyone that we speak to, I like to ask kind of what's on their Christmas wish list in terms of their career for the following year. Like, where uh, where can you be in a realistic world this time next year? Obviously, it's not ideal to ask you this on fight week because everything could, you know, boxing is so unpredictable. Anything could happen. But realistically... Where do you want to be? Where can you be this time next year? Uh, world champion. Okay. Um, get get back get back to winning ways Friday night and um, look to build on a good twenty twenty one. Um, all the hopes and aspirations we had for this year, we can take into next year and and just really plough through. Um, but we're no boxing here, regardless of lockdowns and whatnot. So. Let's just be on it, stick on it over Christmas and look to make these biggest and best fights happen and get a title around our waist in 2021. I'm going to ask you a strange question now, and I don't know if it's a great question or a terrible question, but should Canelo beat Callum Smith, which we hope doesn't happen, we want the Brit to win, if Callum Smith were to lose his belts, who would you prefer to get a rematch with? Because he'd be in the same, uh, I guess, position in terms of being beltless as Rocky Fielding, if you could only rematch one of those two guys, which both beat you controversially, who would you rematch? Uh, I'd say I'd say Smith. He's been he would have been the number one super middleweight in the world. Um, that's the, the natural fight to take. But I believe if, if Smith loses this Saturday, then he would move up to one seven five. Yeah. Okay. All right, then, John, just uh, if you've got any closing words just to our listeners before we let you go, my friend, I appreciate you doing this, like I say, from the hotel room in the in, in the bubble in, in, in Hollywood. Uh, if you've got any closing words, my man, before we let you go, take it away. Uh, no, just thanks for all the support since, since the Smith fight, all people's kind words, and um, it's been encouraging, it's been frustrating at times with this year, but hopefully get this test result back shortly get downstairs for a nice little session that we sort out and get back to winning ways on Friday and, and big to, big build towards the big 2021 20, and um, hopefully bring some titles for the fans. Absolutely well said. Listen, John, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my friend. Best of luck for Friday. I've downloaded the zone now. I've only done it. I'm not bothered about Golovkin, not bothered about Canelo. It's, I'm being honest. I've, I've got the zone mainly for you. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday. Thanks for your time. We'll catch up sometime after. Cheers, Joe. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Just one piece of news to mention. If anything else develops by the end of the show, I'll mention it at the very end. Um, January 30th. uh, This one has been announced for January 30th. It is Artur Baturbiev back in the ring defending his titles against Adam Danes. It's going to be taking place in Moscow. So uh, that is quite something. Um, so yeah, credit to Adam Danes as well for taking the fight. It was one that was supposed to take place um, this year, and it was pushed back because of coronavirus, and it's now 
you know, been penciled in for early next year. So that is a, a big fight. And Adam Danes isn't a bad fighter as well. He's he's really not. So uh, all the best there to both men. Moving on to the preview part of the show. We're going to start over that kind of direction, I guess. Uh, tomorrow night in Kiev, Ukraine, we get to see Dmitro Mitrofanov, who is... 9-0 and with a draw. This one's for the vacant WBO Oriental Super Welterweight title. He takes on Britain's very own Asinia Byfield, who's now 14-3 and with a draw. Byfield, um, seeming like he is enjoying fighting in, in uh, that part of Europe. I think it's a few times on the bounce now he's been fighting outside of the UK. Uh, anyway, moving out now to the Fly By Night Rehearsal Studios back in Redditch. There was a fight there last week, and there's a fight there again this week. Again on Channel 5. Do not miss this one. It comes on at 10.30 p.m., so get that one on the recorder. Uh, we get to see on the undercard, I think we get to see Mick Hennessy Jr. again. He's 5-1 and one with a draw. I believe he's fighting on that card. Um, I think even Stephen McKenna, one of the McKenna brothers, he, f- he literally fought... Um, last Friday, and he's he's back here six and zero, and of course the main event, brilliant, brilliant fight for the British light heavyweight title. Shakan Pitters, the undefeated six foot six light heavyweight, he takes on a uh, very good friend of the show, friend of mine, Craig Richards, fifteen and one with a draw over twelve rounds. All the best to Craig Richards, man. Um, he's one of my sort of close friends in boxing, so. I really hope he can win. And he's a, he's quite an underdog as well with the bookies. Take a little look at that. Might be uh, tempting looking at those odds there. Moving out now to the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, USA. Again, all of this and the next card as well all take place on Friday. So it's a busy Friday. Um, on the undercard, we get to see Hyun Michoy. She is defending her WBA World Super Featherweight title. She, of course, won a world title on her pro debut. She's now signed with Eddie Hearn's Matchroom Sports. She's 17-0 and with a draw. She's in a 10-2-minute round contest against Calista Silgado, who's 19-11 and with three draws. We also get to see the man that we just spoke to a few minutes ago, John Ryder, 28-5. and He's in a 10-rounder against Mike Guy, who's 12-5 and with a draw. Mike Guy, of course, holds a win against Dennis Duglin um, last year, I believe it was. And Mike Guy is quite a tough guy. I think he's about 41 years of age, but tough. Only been stopped once. And, um, yeah, he... He's not as bad as his record suggests he is. Also on the card for the vacant IBO World Super Middleweight title, Ali Akhmadov. He's actually uh, signed to GGG Promotions. He's 16-0. and He takes on Carlos Gongora, who's 18-0. and That one's over 12 rounds. And the main event, Gennady Golovkin, 40-1 and with a draw on... Uh, on the zone, of course, this one as well. And you can get it in the UK now as well. It's just become available, I think, um, within the last couple of weeks. It's £1.99 a month at the moment. So I'm sure they're going to fly up with that, subscri- uh, blah, with that subscription um, soon. So get in there while you can. Um, he takes on Camille Serometa, who's 21 and 0. Um, a Polish fighter, obviously, and a guy that, to be honest... Hasn't really boxed anyone of note in the pros. Not a big puncher either. He's only got five KOs from those 21 wins. His best kind of standout win, to be honest, would be maybe Ruben Diaz for the EBU European middleweight title. But I don't think Diaz is that great anyway. He's got a win against Kasim Uma back in 2016. Yeah, it's not the most impressive record at all. But, you know, it is another fight. It's pretty much a keep-busy fight, I think, for Golovkin. We want to see him in the bigger fights. He is definitely coming to the end of his career. He's 38 himself now, Golovkin. But anyway, all the best to to him. Uh, Moving out now again on the Friday to the Galveston Island Convention Center in Texas, USA. Uh, Over here, another friend of the show, heavyweight Michael Hunter. His opponent, I don't think it's been announced just yet who he's fighting. It doesn't show it online. I forgot to ask him who he's boxing. Or maybe he told me and I forgot. I don't know. He's on the undercard, but top in the bill it is um it is Gilberto Ramirez, the former super middleweight world champion. He's forty and O. I think that makes him have I think he's probably got one of the longest undefeated records now in boxing. Because it was 
uh, Deontay Wilder with about 41 or 42. Obviously, it, he was one of the kind of more known guys that had undefeated records. We had the, you know, that that other guy, Freud Fakeweather. He's now lost his his, his uh, undefeated streak, 54 and 0. He got to, but I think um, Gilberto Ramirez is probably right up there. Maybe even the most longest win streak. But anyway, 40 and 0. He takes on over 12 rounds. Alfonso Lopez, who's 32 and 3. That one's for the NABF light heavyweight title. Gilberto Ramirez is also promoting that show as well. It's on Fight TV. But it's about $25 or something to watch that. So I don't think I'm going to get involved in that one. Anyway, moving out now. This one takes place on Saturday in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ilunga Makabu, obviously the brother of um, Martin Bacoli. This guy, of course, uh, Makabu. Brits will know because he he got knocked out by Tony Bellew for the WBC Cruiserweight title. But he's now champion himself. So he defends his WBC World Cruiserweight title. He's 27-2. and two. He takes on Olin Rawaju Duradola, who's 34-7. and seven. Um, So all the best there to Makabu. Moving out now to Germany, and we've been saying it, this pandemic has sprung a lot of comebacks from former world champions. A lot of guys coming out of retirement after six years. This guy hasn't had six years off, but he's had four years off. He's a former world champion. He is um, 41 years of age now. Um, And I think he's even done some prison time as well in the last four years during his retirement. I think he went to jail because he was on PEDS and something to do with tax evasion, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, he's back in the ring. The return of Felix Sturm, 40 and 5 with three draws. He's in a 10-rounder against Timo Rost, who is 10 and 0, undefeated with two draws. Yeah, Felix Sturm. Um... I always quite liked Felix Sturm, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, He didn't fight since winning uh, back his world title to Chudinov, I believe it was, and it was very controversial. Um, Anyway, moving out now to Spain at the Bolera Severino Prieto in Cantabria. There you go. You know you love that, Eddie. (laughs) What? You said that's good Spanish? Kind of Spanish. Kind of Spanish. Kind of. Insult him. Say- Insult him. Anyway. I would be like that. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, Sergio Martinez back in action. He's 52-3 and three with two draws. He's in a 10-rounder against Jussi Cavoila, who is 24-7 and seven with a draw. The name might ring a bell if you're a British fight fan because Cavoila um, got stopped by... Connor Ben in his last fight, which was actually in June of 2019. That's the last fight, by the way, that I covered as a boxing media guy. That's the last fight I went to in uh, June 2019. It's been such a long time, man, since I've gone to a show. It's killing me. But anyway, Cavoyla gets in against Sergio Martinez. Quite a strange one to say that he's boxed Conor Ben and then um, and then Sergio Martinez. But anyway, that's over 10 rounds there. And topping that bill, Sergio Garcia, he defends his EBU European Super Welterweight title. He is 32-0. and He takes on Andronik Hakobian who is 14-1 and one with two draws. Never heard of him. Um, moving out now to the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut, USA. We have over here uh, Gary Antonio Russell. This is a fight that's gone under the radar. I love this fight, man. Gary Antonio Russell, 17-0. and 0. I think he's got about 12 by KO. Um, obviously, younger brother of Gary Russell Jr. He takes on former world champion Juan Carlos Payano. That's a brilliant fight there. 21-4 and four, Payano. That has gone under the radar because there's so many big fights this weekend. I love that fight, man. I love that fight. We also get to see Emmanuel Rodriguez, 19-1. and one. It's for the interim WBC World Bantamweight title. Nonito Donaire was supposed to be taking him on, but of course, he got COVID. He's out of the fight. In steps the undefeated Raymart Gaballo, who is 23 and 0. Never seen the guy fight, but apparently he's quite good, so that could be interesting. But he hasn't had much notice at all. And topping the bill, Jaron Ennis, 26 and 0 for the vacant IBO World Welterweight title. He takes on South Africa's Chris Van Heerden, 28 and 2, with a draw. Um, very bright future. 
obviously for Jaron Ennis. Um, yeah, your your Twitter page loves him, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think he's a really talented young fighter, man. He has a he has a hell of a future ahead of him. You know what I mean? He has a lot of a lot of promise, obviously. That's that's the understatement of the of the century. But um, you know, still got to give him some time to get into with some some you know some real top guys to really really see the potential even you know further. Um, you know, even a couple uh, guys who who were near the top who kind of fell off a little bit, or you know. Whatever, just something like that to kind of really test him and see his his toughness and you know and, and and you know if you see some adversity and how he deals with it and all those types of things. So, but as far as talent and upside, I, I don't know if there's a there's a fighter out there that has more. So it's a good look that uh, on his kids uh, to be on his kids team right now. It definitely is. And Jaron Ennis is you know, a guy with such a brilliant record on paper, 26 and O with 24 KOs. He's got 16 knockouts in a row. Now he's looking to make that 17 Chris Van here. Then he's not fantastic, but you know, he's okay. He's got the two losses. One was a split, the uh, split decision back in 2010. So a long time ago now. And then his other loss came to Errol Spence. He got KO'd in round eight back in 2015. So he's not bad. And I tell you what, if um, I'm prepared to say, if Ennis takes him out before round eight and does better than Spence did, then it's a statement. But um, I like Chris Van Heerden. His um, his father got murdered actually uh, within the last couple of years. Um, I think where his father lived in South Africa, it was uh, like a really a dangerous place to be for for a white man. And he he got killed. I believe it was a racially motivated crime. I think some black guys. Um, shot and killed his father which is very 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 sad so uh his kind of head has been out the game a little bit really so i was surprised to see him back he's been out the ring for uh for 16 months i think it probably happened in that time but um all the best to him but he's he's up against it against ennis who's just looking like a steam train at the minute that one's on showtime on saturday and then moving out to the final bill it takes place in san antonio at the alamo dome in texas usa the undercard to be honest isn't up to much at all. Let's just jump straight on to the main event. Saul Canelo Alvarez, he's the A-side, but he is the challenger. He takes on Britain's very own Callum Smith. 27-0, and 0. it's for the WBA Super World Super Middleweight title and the Ring Magazine belt and the vacant WBC Super Middleweight titles on the line as well. Um, it's a good fight. It is a very good fight. Um, I don't know if you've seen any pictures of the pair together, Eddie, but if you have, the size difference is unbelievable. Have you seen any pictures of the two stood together? I, I Honestly, I think I might have, but I, honestly, I would expect it looks even crazier than me and Vladimir. <laughs> so so it, was, it, was, it was a huge difference. I mean, I know that Calvin Smith, Smith is, what, 6'3", <laughs> and, what, and, and, how, and I think Canelo's, what, 5'7". So it's it's just it's 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 going to be crazy to see them in the ring together, and especially if 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 Canelo is doing the business, which is is kind of you know what most would expect. But man, this dude is Callum Smith is not just another guy to be on his re, his resume. He's a tough, tough, tough guy, man. He can box. He he's rangy. He, he you know one thing though is um, he's not the fastest guy. In, in the world, but his timing is good. He understands his, he knows his way around the ring. Good range guy, you know what I mean. Good punching power. You know, got he got a good uh good level of confidence, man. It's 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 gonna be interesting. I'm actually really looking forward to it. I want to see how much he can really test Canelo, and really see where he is, and shit, maybe see how much Canelo can test him, because he hasn't lost yet. You know, what I mean? he hasn't really dealt with that much adversity, so. It's going to be interesting this fight, just in, in so many different ways, so many, for so many different reasons. It's going to be it's going to be a good night. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Like I say, we thought that we wouldn't even get to see Canelo in a ring this year, but we are getting it. Um, and yeah, you know, he he's back. It's it's a it's a good fight. It's it's probably one of the um, better fights that really can get made realistically. 
obviously, you know, he's coming off that that win against Kovalev. That was a brilliant win. After uh, before that, he, he boxed Jacobs, and then before that, Rocky Fielding, who's an interesting one because, of course, both guys box Ricky uh, Rocky Fielding, and you know, Canelo. It took him three rounds. It took Callum Smith just one round, but you can't read into that too much. Callum Smith, though, absolutely huge for the weight, um, a tremendous body puncher. He's great at using, uh, you know, using his range, using his distance, keeping it long. Um, he will obviously be trying to box from the outside, and Canelo will be trying to box on the inside. And Callum, um, it's going to be interesting because he's really not a guy that boxes on the back foot kind of thing. He he does fight good up close, but he's not boxing people like Canelo. So it's going to be interesting because I think Canelo is going to be the one coming forward. And I don't know how Callum's going to fight going backwards because I can't remember ever seeing him do that really. But yeah, you know, he's a good fighter. He's one of the best fighters that we've got here in Britain. And, you know, he's earned, you know, he's earned it really. He's, he's, he doesn't have the biggest profile and it's unfair because like I say, he's one of our best guys. He won the World Boxing Super Series. He knocked out George Groves. He's got some brilliant wins. He didn't look great last time out against John Ryder. Again, the guy that we spoke to earlier on in the show, but I've always said it about Callum Smith. I've said it to Callum Smith. When he fights someone and there's no fear factor there, he looks he looks quite bad, quite quite bang average. When he fights a guy where he knows he is, you know, he can't cut any corners, he can't have any mental lapses in the fight, he needs to be on his A game. He performs at his best. So I think we're going to see the best of Callum Smith. I really do. Um you know, they both boxed in November of last year, so they've both got that same kind of level of ring rust. He hasn't had too much notice. That's the one thing that kind of upsets me a little bit. He hasn't had so much notice for the fight. I don't know how many weeks it is. But, you know, he's flew over there, and he, I think, will take it extreme. You have to take it extremely serious. A win here, I mean, his whole career would change. But... um it, it's yeah, it's a great fight. I can't stress enough how much of a great fight it is, and I seriously think that even though again he didn't look great against Ryder, there's a few fights he hasn't looked great in. I remember him boxing a guy. Um, I think it was before the World Boxing Super Series. He didn't look good against him. I think he took him the distance. Um, I can't remember. Maybe maybe he didn't. I think it was Norbert Nemesapati. I'm sure that was it. Um. Yeah, someone like that. You know, he hasn't looked great. There's been fights, you know, Christopher Rebras. I remember, do you remember him? He's, he's, I haven't heard his name for years. But, you know, Nicola Schwetlocker. These were guys that he boxed and he looked bang average, man. He really did. But when he got into the World Boxing Super Series, he beat Eric Skoglund, who, of course, suffered um, injuries in that fight that, uh, that you know, made his career come to an end. It was a good win, though. Then he boxed the kickboxer that came in at late notice. And he didn't box that well against Nicky Holskin. He went the distance. Then he boxed George Groves. It was a great win. Uh, he took Hassan and Dam, you know, apart, really. He was way too small, you know, especially coming up to super middle. And, yeah, he's not he's not coming off a good win over Ryder. A lot of people thought Ryder won the fight. But I've always said it, and I'm, I'm repeating myself now, so I'm going to move on quickly. But he fights to the level of his opponent. If he doesn't have any fear factor, he's bang average. It's just as simple as that. He will be fearful of Canelo. He will box as best as he can. His brother, Liam Smith, has boxed Canelo. He will, you know, he knows Canelo inside out. Liam Smith has even gone into uh, training camps against guys who have, uh, you know, gone into training camps with guys who are preparing to fight Canelo, and he replicates Canelo. So Liam Smith, is, he knows him very well, and that's Callum's brother. So I think they've, they're going to have quite a clever game plan, even though Callum Smith is nothing like Liam Smith. They fight completely different, and one of them uh, it's like, you know, one, one is absolutely huge in terms of height, the other one isn't. But it's going to be very interesting. I'm really looking forward to it, and um, I'm going to move on before I start repeating everything. But I think Canelo, probably on points, even though Callum's a brilliant body puncher, he's got quite a slim frame himself. Um, I don't know how he's going to react to Canelo's body shots, you know. Canelo seems like he's got a lot of power. You saw what he did to Kovalev. Um, it's going to be a great fight, though, man. And you can't write Callum off. Absolutely, you can't. When you see the pair up close, the size difference is crazy. Even though I think the camera angle that I saw it from was favouring um, Callum, I think it was from his side. It looked he looked a lot bigger. I've seen other angles where he doesn't look as big, but he still is the much bigger man. 
Um, I think Canelo on points can't really write him off, but um, I hope Callum does really well. I don't want to see him get stopped. I hope I'd love to see him pull it off. Um, obviously, being a Brit, being a friend of the show. But anyway, that is it for the preview part. We did the news, we did the review part, we've just done the preview part. We brought in our sole guest, John Ryder. The final thing to do is to say goodbye to you, Eddie. Thanks once again for joining me on this week's podcast and going through it all. It's always a pleasure doing it with you, man. I always appreciate it. Not a problem, man. Thank you for having me again. No problem, Eddie. Thank you. And like I say, um, remember to to send us in those Christmas, um, uh, those those end of year pound for pound lists and all the rest of it i'm going to put a tweet out as well next week asking for people to send those in we're going to read them out and remember do not miss next week's show next week's show will be with a very special guest a a royalty in british boxing so do not miss that next week the christmas special but anyway that's it from me this week that's it from eddie and um, i'm going to come in now with the outro in just a few seconds Okay, and this wraps up episode 270 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the former WBA interim super middleweight world champion, John Ryder. There has been one piece of news break whilst we've been recording the show, and it's that on January 30th, Caleb Plant will be defending his IBF super middleweight world title against former world champion Caleb Truax, both from and a friend of the show, so best of luck to both guys there. May the best man win. But that's about everything from myself now. Remember to send in those pound for pound lists and all the rest of it. I'll put out a tweet next week. And also remember to tell a friend to tell a friend about the podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in once again this week, and we shall see you all again next week with the 2020 Christmas special. Until then, stay safe, take good care, and enjoy this weekend of action.